All right. Thank you, Libby. Thanks. Thanks for having me here tonight. Thanks, Libby and Brian, for um, inviting me to speak. I um, have seen a couple of the salty topics, but happy that we can throw in some archaeology and some history and, and learn about some of these uh, uh, interesting places that we can visit um, and are just as interesting for the marine life and the other kind of underwater life that they uh, attract as, as they are interesting for archaeologists and historians. So when you think about Florida um, and the Civil War, you don't necessarily think about a lot of shipwrecks or um, necessarily really anything too big or too much to do with the Civil War. Um, when you think about the Civil War in Florida, just kind of blurt it out, what comes to mind, if anything? Yeah. Big Bayou. Big Bayou, okay, okay. Some local history. Battle of the Lusty. Yeah, Battle of the Lusty. And that's, for the most part, that's the, the largest skirmish or battle and most well known in Florida. Um, I think all told there was about 140, I may have that number wrong, um, skirmishes during the Civil War that took place in Florida. Uh, the most well known in the Tampa Bay area is is uh, is known as the Battle of Ballast Point that took place in October of 1862 over in Tampa, and we'll talk about that battle and uh, kind of the results of that battle um, when we talk about some of the other shipwrecks. Um, first, uh, as a, a little bit of an introduction, I wanted to uh, let you all know who I was, Jeff Motes. I'm the director of the regional centers for the Florida Public Archaeology Network that are hosted by the University of South Florida. Um, so we have two bosses, more or less, um, a boss at USF and a boss at FPAN. And FPAN is a statewide network um, that's uh, headquartered up in Pensacola at the University of West Florida. Um, and uh, we were set up about 10, 12 years ago, really just to, to talk about underwater archaeology, talk about archaeology in Florida. Um, and, uh, and how it enriches everybody's lives, people that live here, people that visit here, um, how we can interact and know more about the past, um, and really encourage people to get out there and learn more about archaeology and history in Florida. We've got a, a, a really unique past. So we were set up to do that, um, and that's really what we do. We don't do a lot of research in FPAN. Um, we don't do contract archaeology. What we do is, is things like this not always on Facebook Live, but uh, usually to an audience um, at libraries, at schools, at historical societies, um, where we try to just talk about archaeology. Uh, we work with a lot of local governments in detailing management plans uh, for archaeological sites and that sort of stuff. So we're kind of all over the map, um, literally. Uh, we're a statewide network, so we've got eight regional centers. University of South Florida is an institutional partner, more or less, in FPAN. And that's uh, who we work for over on campus. Um, and uh, the two centers that I direct are the West Central and the Central Regional Centers. So Flagler College, Florida Atlantic University, all of our centers are uh, staffed by a couple of archaeologists. And this is what we do primarily, talk about archaeology till we're blue in the face. Um, so we get a lot of bang for our buck like this with partnerships. We work a lot with um, the extension service, especially over here at Weedon Island, we've got a lease agreement um, that gives us <clears throat> the ability to host a lot of programs and do all kinds of different and uh, unique kind of events over here. And so our partnerships really give us that, that biggest bang for our buck, more or less. We have offices over at the University of South Florida, um, but really our office is our vehicle so we can get in and go places, um, learn about and obviously talk about sites archaeological sites and so we like to live by this mantra that a little bit of education leads to some understanding and appreciation of archaeology especially Florida's past um, you're all in this room because you're interested and it's really great it's great to see um, and uh, we think that only that's gonna just kind of expand and continue to build um, so we've had a, a good run for 10 or 12 years working with lots of different partners and different groups and uh, especially the kiddos and we um, run a summer camp out here so if any of you guys have the little children between 7 and 11 and you want to sign them up for an archaeology summer camp it's a unique experience and uh, it's a lot of fun for us so um, just you can ask one of us after the uh, after the presentation um, 
Archaeology does a lot for us. Uh, there's a bottom line. Um, there was a, 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 an economic impact study that was undertaken back in 2007, 2008, looking at kind of the economic impact of heritage tourism and historic preservation in the state of Florida. Um, and they determined through that study that uh, archaeology, history, heritage tourism brings in about $6 billion a year into the Florida's uh, bottom line, which is a significant kind of little niche um, there in a tourism economy. But what we like to talk about is kind of these non-tangible things, these quality of life issues um, that archaeology and knowing more about our past can really kind of uh, bridge and build in our lives. So a lot of like sense of place and c community heritage and character preservation and aesthetics and that sort of stuff. And certainly um, archaeology, shipwrecks, underwater archaeology really draws people into Florida. Florida is one of the the world's largest dive destination. More people come here to dive than anywhere else in the world, um, especially down in the Florida Keys. There's lots and lots of shipwrecks down there, but there's lots and lots of shipwrecks everywhere. And so one of the, the topics that we'll talk about is how the state of Florida kind of manages this, promotes it to um, um, potential divers or people that are already here uh, to try to encourage more participation and understanding in uh, Florida's past and all about Florida's shipwrecks. Um, so the first part of the presentation, well, I will add one other thing. If you guys are really interested in shipwrecks, want to know more about it, the Central Gulf Coast Archaeological Society meets here just, uh, just about every, what, third Thursday of the month. Um, and this Thursday, well, February 15th, the next meeting, um, they're going to host uh, Dr. John Bratton. He's an underwater archaeologist, my old uh, professor from the University of West Florida. Um, and he's going to come and talk about Florida's oldest shipwreck site. So these are colonial shipwrecks that uh, went down in a storm in 1559 up in Pensacola Bay. So a lot, a lot older than the Civil War wrecks we're going to talk about tonight um, and even more interesting if you're into that colonial sort of stuff. So um, the first bit that I want to talk about is this picture here, and i give you a little bigger image. Um, who knows what we're looking at? Maybe you divers that have been on this site can help us out. Sonar image. Yeah, it's a sonar image. And so this is one way that, um, say the water's really, really murky, that we try to figure out what we're looking at. Um, underwater archaeologists employ uh, several or a couple of remote sensing uh, techniques or remote sensing equipment um, to really try to determine, you know, uh, any any uh, objects that are above the sea floor. Um, it's part of the survey work that goes on before you actually uh, get to jump on, dive on a shipwreck site, and try to figure out what it is. This particular sonar image was taken back in 2006, um, and it was a partnership that. Uh, the, the archaeologists and the group through the Florida Aquarium were working with, I think it was with the DOD, Department of Defense, or it was a, a research and development group that had a DOD contract. And so they were, um, wanted to test out some toys. And in 2006, 2007, this was state of the art. And it looks pretty good, still pretty good today. But the technology has increased and advanced so much that today's so side scan sonar images look like um, just like a digital photograph that you would take with you with your camera almost. Um, but this particular one is really interesting. This is the site of the USS Narcissus. And this is kind of a, a, a th more or less, a, what do you call it? A oblique view of the shipwreck site. And here's a plan view of the shipwreck site. So on the day, the particular day that they, they took these pictures, um, it might have been clear, it might not have been clear, but these sonar images show up. But there was somebody that showed up on picture day, and this is one of the Goliath groupers that live out there. Pretty good image. Um, and uh, there's like six or seven brothers and sisters that show up every once in a while. And if you guys are divers and you've been in the water with a Goliath grouper, um, I don't know about you, but they scare the living bejesus out of me um, just because of their size and girth and the way they stare at you and don't look away. <laughs> Um, so this one showed up on picture day and it gives us a really good glimpse into the objects that are down there at USS Narcissus and Narcissus is one of the shipwrecks that's associated with the Civil War that ended up wrecked in Tampa Bay and we're going to talk a little bit more about it um, and here's a real picture showing the propeller and the propeller shaft that some of the remains left at USS Narcissus um, so 
These are the uh, remote sensing gear that a, a standard underwater archaeological outfit will use or employ to do uh, just a general survey. A magnetometer is kind of a, a metal detector, underwater metal detector. It picks up, um, excuse me, picks up ferrous anomalies or other iron objects that are in the embedded in the seafloor or just down there that may be hard to see. Um, and then a side scan sonar. Uh, you saw one of the images from that and a sub bottom profiler is also a, a sonar machine um, that sends low energy pulses but that can penetrate the bottom. So even if a shipwreck or shipwreck remains are not up off the seafloor that a side scan sonar will pick up um, and, and sometimes they're buried where you get a slight uh, signature from that magnetometer. A side scan, couple all these things together and will give you a good picture of what might be buried out there. And So these are the standard remote sensing gear, remote sensing equipment that are employed in underwater archaeology. Now the technology has advanced where um, there's a couple of companies that are outfitting and, and trying to figure out an underwater laser scanner and so that's kind of the cutting edge technology, a total station underwater um, I guess uh, that will really kind of map and do everything that all three of these, well not the sub bottom profiler but um, the other ones will do to really create uh, good uh, imagery, things that you can measure without even really getting um, your toes wet and jumping in and doing it yourself. So back to the Narcissus. USS Narcissus was a blockader. She was a little tugboat. And the, the, the theme of this presentation, really kind of the historical theme, is that during the Civil War, um, both navies uh, were not um, so well, I guess, equipped or founded uh, or, or uh, put together. And so the Civil War was really a point in time in the United States history where um, the United States Navy really increased in size and, and just sheer number of boats. And the Mary Cook, which was renamed USS Narcissus when she was commissioned into service in 1863, is a really good example of that. Um, so here's what she may have looked like, an 80 foot, 83 foot tugboat that was really built for work in the inner harbor of New York, um, not so much for uh, a war service, um, but she was employed in the Civil War nonetheless. Today she sits out on the Egmont Shoal north of the big, big shipping channel um, in about 14 feet of water, and so we'll kind of get into the story a little bit. She was part of, uh, of, of this strategy that the, the United States took um, to really kind of put a stranglehold on the South. It was called the blockade or the Anaconda Plan as Winifred Scott um, um, called it when he um, brought it to Abraham Lincoln and said, you know, let's go ahead and employ this into service. Um, and it was quite successful. What it was, was a blockade of all the Southern ports, nothing coming in, nothing coming out. Um, but what did they need? They needed a lot more boats. Um, so at the beginning of the war, there was about 80 registered vessels as part of the United States Navy. And by the end of the war, you can see in 1864, that number had um, increased exponentially or um, as a word that I like to use, and maybe I just made up this word, but it's called octrupled. Um, so <laughs> you can use that, you can hashtag it maybe if we're on Facebook Live. Um, but anyways, by 1864, they were employing just about anything that hit the water that could be used in, in the blockade, um, in the Anaconda Plan, and really put into service for the Civil War. And the, the Mary Cook, as she was uh, christened, really fit this bill kind of well. Um, she was launched in 1863 in Albany, New York, a wooden hold screw tug. Um, in 1863, that was kind of an advancement with a, a single cylinder inverted um, overhead acting engine, 81 feet of length, uh, 18 feet of breadth, and about eight foot of hold, and uh, had a single boiler. So she was built to be a tugboat, um, push other boats around and do kind of service like that. When she was employed in the, in, in the United States Navy, more or less acted the same way, but had some, um, I guess, some refitting kind of uh, uh, provisioned on, on, her, on her deck and, and elsewhere. Um, so this was how they armored um, steam tugs back in the 1860s. They put a big land cannon on top of them. Um, armed with a 120 pounder Parrot rifle and a heavy 12 pounder, um, she was put into service and act as, as kind of a, a, a dispatch vessel or a kind of a messenger vessel and was employed in the East Gulf Blockading Squadron. So from New York, 
steamed all the way around, uh, all the way around Florida, the peninsula of Florida, and then was kind of headquartered up in Mobile Bay, where she spent the remainder of the service of, of her service in the Civil War. Um, USS Narcissus saw some action in Mobile Bay as part of that East Gulf blockading squadron. Um, actually ran upon a mine or a Confederate torpedo and blew a hole um, in her starboard hull. Uh, she was refloated out of 16 feet of water and then drug over to Pensacola and refit the hull um, and then put back into service before the end of the war. Um, so uh, not a lot of action it was kind of the end of what was going on um, down in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, but um, was there and then was finally decommissioned in January of 1866, I believe. And that's kind of how she ended up offshore Tampa Bay. Um, so got the decommissioned notice, uh, was sent over to be more or less outfitted in Pensacola on January 1st, 1866. Uh, steamed down with another vessel, a sister vessel, another tugboat called the USS Althea. Um, and they made it offshore Tampa Bay in a couple of days. Um, what was recorded in the ship's log was an increasing gale winds and seas, so it must have been a pretty nasty uh, cold front that was coming across the Gulf of Mexico at that point that was really whipping it up. The two captains um, really kind of advised each other. Um, uh, they wanted to make it inshore on the backside of Egmont Key, apparently, um, but neither of them really knew the entrance into, into the bay, um, so they decided to stay offshore and try to wait out the storm. Um, what's known about the two vessels and how they kind of uh, uh, were orchestrated kind of out there offshore of Egmont Key is both of them probably put their heads into the wind, um, had the steam engines running full strength to try to keep them from being drug up onto the shoals and whatnot, and had, you know, may have had one or two anchors let out um, to try to hold their position. What happened with the Narcissus is she was drug up on the Egmont Shoal um, there was some signal flares, and this is all recorded in the ship's log of the USS Althea, so there's some really good information out there of the wrecking event. Signal flare of distress from Narcissus was shot up. Althea returned the appropriate signal, and then what's recorded in, in the Althea's log is a signal that they couldn't understand. And what it probably was, and what the captain relayed the next day, was most likely the explosion that caused, caused Narcissus to really sink and be a total loss. There were 26 men aboard, um, all lost their lives. So it was a complete disaster, a real disaster, especially for them and their families. Um, Althea, the next day, uh, as the winds died down and the seas dies down, died down, were able to see all the debris along Egmont Key and Mullet Keys there. They recovered the body of one of the sailors um, and then made it on their way back to New York Harbor. So a, a, a disaster, a, a, a ship's grave, more or less, um, that's here off of Egmont Key that's associated with the Civil War. Um, so not action in the Civil War, but ended, ended up here in 1866. So a, a sad affair nonetheless. Um, Narcissus is out there about two miles off of Mullet Key in 14 feet of water. And uh, she wasn't a big boat, about 81 feet long. So it's not a huge archeological site. And what's out there still are some of the larger remains that um, we're in the kind of belly of the boat and under the bottom, under the water line. So what you can see is uh, the engine remains or that kind of engine frame, the propeller and the propeller shaft, the remain of that, and then a lot of debris out here towards the south, kind of the south and a little bit east of where the engine and the propeller are. Um, and this is only from here to here is only about, I don't, I don't know, probably about 15 feet, not, very, not, very, not a very big site but an interesting sight nonetheless. A lot of relief off the bottom with these few objects, and so it really attracts quite the array of marine life. Lots and lots of bait fish, which bring in other big fish, lots of snapper, groupers hanging out, and of course the goliaths are always swimming around. And they're like the big bears of the sea, I guess. Um, you walk through the woods where bears are located, uh, apparently, and you can see their scratching posts and whatnot. Well, that's what the Goliaths do to this guy, um, due to these these objects that uh, are, are the remains of the Narcissus and probably some sea turtles too. Um, but every time I'm out there, the site is different. Um, it's different because of the dynamic kind of a longshore environment with the shifting sands and whatnot. But for since 1866, that site has remained there. 
um, even though through all the hurricanes, through all the big storms, um, through all of this kind of shifting and, and this dynamic marine environment, and really has encouraged you know, a, a nice artificial reef to set up out there. So it's a, it's a really interesting site. And that's always part of underwater archeology. span When we're out there trying to document these shipwreck sites, it's really um, sometimes, sometimes by braille, and that's where the remote sensing gear really comes in to help. Um, but often we get some, some good visibility and out at the Narcissus, it's good when there hasn't been a lot of rain and you get a good kind of inshore tide or, or a high tide. Um, but what we do is take, wa take tapes and slates um, that have some mylar on them and a number two pencil, really technical gear. And uh, we're down just taking a lot of measurements and doing a lot of recording. And so that's um, part of the process of underwater archaeology because that gives us a sense of, you know, trying to figure out the site, what's visible, what may be there, the extent of the site. Really, we've got to figure out by doing some probes in a systematic way, um, either through, uh, uh, you know, just kind of picking a point and going out from there until you don't feel anything anymore. So some rudimentary kind of skills are, are uh, you need to have uh, to be an underwater archaeologist and figure this sort of stuff out. If you're doing a lot of remote sensing, of course, that's a different skill set. And it takes years and years to really develop a sense to be able to interpret all that data that you get back from magnetometers and side scan sonars and even sub bottom profilers. But more and more, it's getting easier and easier, I guess. But, you know, a lot of underwater archaeologists out there might not say might might not agree with me anyways um, Narcissus is a really interesting site because of all of these factors it's not big it encourages a lot of marine life um, and this is a, a war grave more or less you know this is the resting place for those 26 men so we've got a lot of different kind of elements going on at the particular USS Narcissus at the site um, I'll get to it in a second, but these are some good images, I guess. Uh, here's the uh, um, engine remains, the frame that's kind of apparently uh, when uh, sport divers first found the site back in the 1970s or first learned of the site and, and were out there quite a bit, the engine frame was sitting right up um, probably over the years just through some storm events and whatnot. She uh, foundered over to her starboard side, or starboard side, I think. Uh, no, that's the port side. Anyways, there she is sitting on the edge. This is it again. This is the cylinder here looking kind of to the south at the engine frame. And this is a, an archaeologist sketch underwater to try to get some good measurements on the different pieces and parts of that make up these objects. And all that goes into a site plan um, that gives us an idea of how the shipwreck's laid. Um, different photographs, just try to document as much as we can through video through photography and also through, uh, you know, lots of hand-drawn notes. This is the propeller um, with uh, three of the blades or two of the blades that are still intact. The propeller shaft that points directly towards the engine remains where the transition would, the transmission would have spun that propeller shaft and then uh, spun the propeller there too. Um, and uh, here's just a, a, a real kind of rudimentary or simple site plan. Um, that uh, hasn't been update, no, updated in a while. So if there's anything that you guys, divers with the Florida Aquarium, um, we need to do is get out there and do some photogrammetry and some more documentation of the shipwreck site. Because I visit the site maybe two or three times a year. And just I said earlier, it's, it's different each time with more exposed or more buried. Um, so it's a really dynamic environment out there. Interesting part about the USS Narcissus is she is also the latest addition to the Florida Shipwreck Preserve System. And this is part of the state's management system to really encourage people to come out and dive. Um, shipwrecks are threatened by all sorts of things, by the marine environment. Eventually they become stabilized and the, the rate of decay or kind of material loss kind of slows down. Um, but as they get visited or as they are visited by you know, people that want to go out and collect and grab stuff just to bring home to, so they can watch it rot in their garage. Um, that happens, and it often happens with shipwreck sites. They're out of sight, out of mind. Um, not a lot of people will see you doing it. Um, so part of what the state of Florida figured out, and this was back in 1987, is let's make some shipwreck parts or museums in the sea for everybody to, you know, to really encourage and to promote participation and, and go out and check out these things and learn about um, Florida's unique, really unique maritime heritage. So it's part of a shipwreck preserve system. There's 12 of them across the state. 
the Florida Aquarium as part of the work that they did with these archaeologists. Their goal was to really um, promote this as one of the shipwreck preserves. And so they nominated the site to the state of Florida. And after a couple of years and lots of approvals from the United States Navy, Coast Guard, uh, environmental resource councils, the state of Florida, it went through lots of proposals. Um, they eventually dedicated it, and I think it was 2015, February 2015, um, when the Narcissus was dedicated as the 12th Underwater Archaeological Preserve. So what does that mean? It gets to be put on a poster like this um, that you send around uh, to all the libraries, anybody that'll have it. A nice brochure is made that details the history of the vessel, the wrecking event, any other interesting tidbits like that. The numbers are published, um, so you can go to this website, museumsinthesea.com. You can check out the numbers, plug them into your boat GPS, and go right to it. It's in 14 feet of water, so it's not a really technical dive, but if you spend all day offshore in 80 feet of water, maybe fishing, shooting fish out there, it's a good kind of dive as you're coming back in in case you uh, didn't, in case you got skunked out offshore. This one might help you out. But, um, they each get a, a big monument, a block of concrete where a nice plaque is inset um, out at the site. The one out at Narcissus is really unique. It's a reef ball. Um, uh, so it's a, it's kind of a, encourages even more living marine organisms to come out there and, and kind of populate the site or colonize the site. Um, and it needs a good scrub in every once in a while. And so what we really try to do is encourage friends groups or groups that can kind of utilize these shipwreck sites, these dive sites as their sites and they become stewards. And so they encourage more people. And so word of mouth spreads. We've got this really unique underwater archeological resource right in our backyard. Um, go check it out. Dive shops kind of become, you know, it's their pet site. It's where they do all their uh, underwater, you know, it's where they do all their dive training and whatnot. And this one's really perfect. It's not in the best location, but it's a good dive and it's easy. Um, and it's a good fishing site. So. The other couple of shipwrecks that I'd like to talk about associated with the Civil War, here's Narcissus out here in uh, Egmont Shoal, are the Cape Dale and Scottish Chief, and they're not out in the open water. Um, they're located up here on land, not really, but in the Hillsborough River. Um, and they're associated with uh, the Battle of Ballast Point, so that's what we're going to kind of end up talking about. Um, and they also exemplify, you know, some good examples, they, they're good examples of Anything that was hit in the water, that was in the water, in Florida, in the Gulf, um, along the eastern seaboard was, was utilized in one way or another during the Civil War, either for service in the United States Navy, employed by the Confederates, or used by cattlemen and profiteers that wanted to make a quick buck by working for one of the other, one of the other sides. And that's when we get the Kate Dale and Scottish Chief. And uh, I know you can see it's um, not the Scottish Chief, and so we'll talk about that in a little bit. But these two ships were kind of the most popular. They were the most well-known Civil War boats, excuse me, um, that were being utilized in Tampa. And really because, uh, well, the, I'll get to that in a second. The Tampa Bay Shipwreck Survey um, was a project and a program that was undertaken by the Florida Aquarium. And this was back, when did it start, in 2005? 2006 when the idea was kind of forming um, and then there was about three or four seasons of some shipwreck work and and to be a good underwater archaeologist really an archaeologist you got to be a history sleuth or kind of figure out you know what was going on in prehistoric Florida but you also have to be a good journalist in a way um, communicate with people that have a lot of information and a lot of knowledge especially in shipwreck archaeology um, because a lot of these sites are already really really well known and in the Tampa Bay area, these three in particular were really well known by the sport diving community. What was his name? Pop Taylor? Is that it? Anyways, he's kind of the most, uh, 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 he's the old timer that then told the younger timers, who are now old timers, all about these shipwrecks back in the 70s. And they went out and, and uh, wanted to jump on them just through sheer interest. Um, also collected a lot of objects from them. So there's bits and pieces of all these shipwrecks kind of running around Tampa Bay area. But that's how um, a lot of people really found out about these particular sites. And it's how the archaeologists and the, the um, Tampa Bay Shipwreck Survey really got off. Um, and, uh, and they learned about these in particular before they went and did any of the, the real survey work in some of the areas where they thought other shipwrecks might be located. 
So anyways, these particular, the Cape Dale and Scottish Chief, are well known because of this guy, James McKay. He was an important figure in mid-19th century Florida history. He was a cattleman, uh, kind of a rustler, uh, a guy that came over when he was 17 or 18 years old, as far as I've been told, chasing a, a, a girl, came over on a steamboat from Scotland, ended up in New Orleans. I don't know if he ended up with the same girl or not. Um, but made his way down to Tampa and uh, has made a good name for himself and his family. Um, the McKay family in Tampa is really well known and, and has uh, remained in the Tampa area for, for quite a long time, started with this guy. Um, he owned the two boats. He owned Cape Dale, he owned Scottish Chief, um, and he had partners with other boats. And what they did was they ran arms and munitions and all kinds of stuff in and out of Florida to help the Confederates they sent cattle up into the Confederate Army to feed them. They were getting paid good. Um, they were running the blockade uh, to the chagrin of the United States Navy. And really, that's what was the impetus for the Battle of Ballast Point, was this guy to try to thwart all of his enterprising or his enterprises. Um, so in October of 1862, he had been caught. He had been put in jail. He had gotten out of jail. He had signed a document that said he won't run the blockade anymore and then he got back into running the blockade um, so they were fed up with him pretty early on and they decided to try to go in and uh, the united states navy and the blockading squadron that was set up out of egmont key um, decided to uh, go and try to uh, ruin his stores and and try to uh, knock out his boats while uh, they were sitting in in wait to uh, to load the vessels so what the the blockading squadron did was they ran two of their boats up into Hillsborough Bay, really up into Tampa Bay, Hillsborough Bay. They offloaded about 100 soldiers um, on Gadsden Point there, which is now uh, MacDill Air Force Base. And these guys marched about 14 miles under the cover of darkness, behind, in the woods, behind what was Fort Brook and where the city of Tampa was really set up and, and a lot of the population there. At the time that they started marching, the two boats went anchored off here and started lobbing cannon fire over Tampa and over Fort Brook just to create a diversion. Um, and it was quite successful. Everybody went in, nobody knew or saw these hundred soldiers or whatnot marching 14 miles up to try to get to McKay's storehouse um, on the Hillsborough River, which is located where Lowry Park Zoo is today. They were successful. They got there, they ambushed McKay's men as they were loading the boats. There were three that were sitting at the dock at McKay's storehouse at that point, Scottish Chief, Kate Dale, and another boat called The Noise, which was owned by one of his partners, Alfred Noise. Um, so they, they ambushed them, they surprised attacked them, and uh, they were successful at ruining their boats and ruining their day. Um, they lit all the boats on fire. The Noise was sent, I guess, upriver from what the documents say. Uh, the Cape Dale was allowed to just kind of burn to the water line right there at the dock. And the Scottish chief, McKay's men, um, tried to save Scottish chief. She was kind of the, the high class vessel that McKay owned at the time. Um, she was kind of the big profit maker. She was a, a side wheel steamboat, steamboat built in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and, and had a pretty good sized engine on her and was able to get in and out of the bars um, and uh, away from the blockaders before they could catch up to them. So Cape Dale burned there to the waterline, and this is what remains of the vessel today. You can see it on a low tide or when, whenever the water in the Hillsborough River is good and visible. Um, and uh, all that exists really now is a bunch of stuff under the muck, um, but some hull planking and ceiling planking, and then these are the, the bits of the ribs that are sticking out of the mud. So she just burned and just like sat there right in the mud. Um, and here's some underwater, underwater images. Um, we knew the story that the Cape Dale was there, the Scottish chief was there, the archaeologists at the time wanted to make sure that what they were looking at was a sailboat, which the Cape Dale was registered as, um, probably a two-masted, maybe schooner-rigged boat um, that was quite successful in running the blockade for McKay and his, and his men. Um, so they did some more extensive archaeology where they actually excavated a little bit through the mud and the muck, a couple of uh, um, um, MRSA incubations later from all the mud and muck of the Hillsborough River, um, they figured out that they didn't get to what they were trying to get after, which was the center line or a mast step to make sure that this was a sailboat. But the, the architecture of the boat, um, how it was all put together, really just 
kind of showed them that this was definitely a sailboat and not something that had a big old engine, a big old steam engine. So they could figure, based on all this kind of circumstantial evidence, that what they were looking at was the Cape Dale. So the mystery remains, what happened with the Scottish chief, right? And here's that picture again. Again, at low tide, you can kind of see the hull remains, the outside of the vessel, and some of the ribs that are there, just that other that picture again. So what remained of the Scottish chief? Um, they had conducted some survey and heard from some of the old timers, some of the, the original sport divers that had dived on and knew exactly where Scottish Chief was located, that she was down here, down river. Um, here's Kate Dale and Lowry Park, down river a good ways, close to where the 275 bridge goes over downtown Tampa. That had always been a place um, that archeologists had really been interested in for a variety of reasons. Scottish Chief was one of them. There's another really famous boat called the Gopher. And any of you, if you follow archaeology in Florida, you know that this guy C.B. Moore had a boat named Gopher that he went up and down the coast, both coasts with, um, and recorded a lot, of, was some of the earliest recordings of a lot of the most famous archaeological sites, mound sites all along the Gulf Coast and, and some on the Atlantic Coast. Um, so archaeologists for a long time had wanted to find these two vessels. This was the Scottish Chief, was kind of the signature vessel of the city of Tampa. Um, and the Gopher was just kind of the most famous boat in archaeology, I guess, as, as far as Florida is concerned. So there had been a lot of underwater survey undertaken in this little stretch and crook of the river. Um, one of the images that they got back from the side scan sonar showed up and gave them an image that looked awfully like the remains of a shipwreck site. And you can see these two kind of parallel sides that you would get, you know, from a, a boat. Um, and then, you know, thought there was a side wheel or a stern wheel. And some of the information about the Scottish chief was um, a little bit daunting to try to, uh, uh, um, I guess, figure out whether she was a side wheel or a stern wheeler. But this image really kind of hit the, hit the jackpot for him. It looked like this might be the remains of the Scottish chief, 141 feet long, so they jumped in the water, took a measuring tape, and uh, it ended up just being really close to that, about 140 feet long. So they thought they had the Scottish Chief, but the investigations in the project, really, they, were only, they only were out there for a couple of days and recorded just a, a little of it. But word got out that the archaeologists with the aquarium had found Scottish Chief. And I think the archaeologists in the aquarium were too, were saying, well, we found something. We don't know what it is. But when it gets in the press, it gets out that it's the Scottish Chief. But it's probably not. Um, in 2000, that was back in 2009. In 2014, there was another survey that was undertaken, required by the state of Florida, um, in advance of some of the construction with the, the Riverwalk and Waterworks Park there. Um, so they went back and resurveyed, jumped in the water, had a little more time, and figured out it was something else. Um, so here it is again, Lowry Park Zoo, way up here on the river, and this is Waterworks Park today. So quite a long time. The idea from what's recorded in the history of that particular event, the Battle of Ballast Point, was that the Scottish chief was kicked away and they tried to salvage the boat or salvage what they could out of the Scottish chief unsuccessful what was recorded. Scottish Chief eventually faltered and, and foundered and, and sunk somewhere in the river, but there's really no good indication of where, except for some of that circumstantial evidence from the divers that she was located down here near Waterworks Park. And so um, here's a little close up of Waterworks Park and pay attention to this little notch in the river that's there. And if how many of you guys have visited Waterworks? It's a really great place over in Tampa. Um, beautiful park and there's lots to do around there, a good lunch spot. Um, but pay attention to this little notch because it's important. This is where that particular image um, was taken from. Now the reason that the state of Florida required it because GPS points were a little wonky and they didn't want to impact uh, what they thought was or what was recorded as the USS Narcissus was some of the construction. So they asked um, the group that was performing the work to hire some archaeologists to go down and resurvey and relook at this thing and try to get some better GPS points. The GPS had the shipwreck or what was thought to be the shipwreck somewhere right around here and there's a dock at Waterworks Park that was going to impact some of those remains so they wanted to make sure to see if that that could go on and be permitted. Um, and here's a, 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 the image again 
that shows what looks like to be a stern wheel steamer. You got your big axle of your paddle wheel back here in the rear of the boat or the stern of the boat, and then the rest of it coming up this way. Um, what those archeologists that in 2014, when they returned to the site, were able to recreate that same image. It's a little dark, but you can see the transverse little brace here, and then these parallel sides that look like the shipwreck. And then here's that bank line notch that shows up in the river right there. What they figured out is that it was a historic marine railway that had been there probably since the late 1800s. Um, and there's some really good evidence that shows it. And so they were able to look at old historical maps. This is a Sanborn and fi Fire insurance map of the city of Tampa. And you can see that here's the marine railways. Everybody know what a marine railway is? It's, a, it's a, a place where you pull up big boats so you can work on them out of the water. Um, and a railway is exactly what it is. It's a railway where they would hook up the boat somewhere a little bit offshore and then yank it up with a big winch and a big motor um, to try to pull that sucker out of the water. And they were pulling big boats out of here. So if you go by Port Tampa, you'll see them now on these dry docks that they actually lift them up out of the water. But back then, um, this was a, a pretty standard method employed to get the boats out of the water so that they could work on the bottom. So this is a 1903 insurance map, and it shows those nice two parallel sides running off into the river. And again, in 1915, a little more, uh, we got another marine railway here and another marine railway, and it was known as the Tampa Steamways Company at that time. Um, and it may have turned into another, play, another steamship or steamways um, called Warren Sweat's Shipyard um, by the 1930s, and there's some good imagery of that. But anyways, um, it kind of goes to show, and, and there's no doubt that there's something going on in that little crook of the, the river. Um, I've been able to talk with some of those sport divers, the original divers that had jumped on these shipwrecks, and swear up and down that Scottish Chief is located, and that's it. And uh, it's not. It's a, it's a marine railway, um, and it's pretty clear. But Anyway, so we haven't found the Scottish Chief. She's still out there um, waiting to be found by somebody at some point. And this is the image. This is a, a really kind of interesting tidbit. Um, back in the late 1930s, as part of the Works Progress Administration, um, there were some sketch artists uh, that were employed to go all around the United States, really, and develop a Historic American Merchant Marine Survey. It's a big, thick, six-volume book that has uh, some good architectural drawings of all of um, the United States or the nation's boats and boat types and different types that were there, putting people to work drawing boats. And this was part of that effort. This was kind of later in, the, in uh, the 1830 or 1930s, 1938. And this is a sketch by um, the individual who was in charge of that effort in Florida, or at least for the Florida boats. His name is Philip Iyer Sawyer. Um, and he, there was some money left over apparently in 1938. And so he convinced his bosses, let him come back down and, and record more stuff that's here in Florida. Although it was never published and not published as part of that Historic American Merchant Marine Survey. An individual by the name of Dan Smith, he's a historian. I think he's retired from NASA. He lives over on the East Coast. He just kind of fell in love with these sketches. He did some, uh, some investigative work and went up to the Library of Congress and found a bunch of them and then worked with the Florida Historical Quarterly to publish them in a, in a little journal, a little book that I've got up here. So afterwards, if you want to take a, a gander at it. But this is a picture and kind of his impression of what that shipyard might have looked like in 1900. So you can see the two marine railways pulling up the big boat. And another kind of anecdote, this boat that he depicts here is the Tarpon, the SS Tarpon which is part of the shipwreck preserve system. She wrecked in uh, uh, 19, 1903 up off Panama City in about 95 feet of water. 17 uh, people aboard and the captain lost their lives on that one. Um, but here she is in kind of a, a depiction of this particular shipyard. There's another ship, there's another marine railway that you can kind of make out here. And this is an image of Gopher. Um, he drew this in 1938, um, so all these boats weren't sitting there at that particular time when he, when he drew this. But it's, it could be that particular railway that's, that's right there at Waterworks Park. Um, and I think it probably is. The buildings off in the background kind of connect with those Sanborn fire insurance maps, but um, who knows? But it's still a pretty cool image. 
So if you're interested in shipwrecks of the Civil War, want to do some more reading, I brought a really good uh, uh, reference book for it. Um, this particular author and, and archaeologist, Gordon P. Watts, is known um, as kind of the foremost authority in, in uh, ships and shipwrecks of the Americas in the age of iron and engineering in the dawn of the Civil War and all the advances that were made in ship types and boats and whatnot. And lots and lots of different boats that were utilized um, as part of the, the efforts on both sides. Um, so kind of back to this, and I'll end on this, but uh, this is a great website to go to if you're interested as well. Um, Museumsinthesea.com. There's lots of videos you can run through, lots and lots of different history about each boat that's kind of narrated for you. So if you're not a diver, but you're interested in this stuff, this is a good resource to take advantage of too. So, yeah. And on the Narcissus page, there's a picture of some of the crew members of oh. Narcissus. That's right. And part of the dedication process in 2015, um, the researcher, Nicole Tumbleson Morris, who wrote Narcissus up as her um, <coughs> master's thesis for the University of West Florida, was able to get in touch with uh, one of the descendants of the individuals that lost their lives on Narcissus. And so they were able to fly him out from San Diego and he was there as part of the dedication process for this Narcissus. So it was pretty cool. But anyways, thank you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>